Space and our culture are inextricably linked. It has always been that way, whether or not you've been aware of it. Millennia ago, it was clearly a part of your culture, whether you were Greek, Egyptian, Babylonian, Native American, Hindu, or Chinese. You looked up to the heavens and drew your heroes and legends into the sky. You used them to tell stories to your children. If you were Greek, you might choose to tell them the story of Queen Cassiopeia of Ethiopia, boasting about her lovely daughter Andromeda and how Perseus came to save her from the rock she was chained to. If you were Native American, you might tell them the story of seven reckless girls who wandered away from camp one night to dance underneath the stars until they were attacked by hungry bears. Naturally, they ran from these bears, climbed to tall rocks, and begged the spirits in the rock to protect them. These, the rock sent these seven girls up into the sky to become the Pleiades. Clearly, the sky had an effect on our early ancestors, and it continued to affect us well into the Middle Ages. Famously, the appearance of visiting stars such as comets or supernovae foretold danger for the ruling class. This happened on one of the most important dates in British history. In 1066, the recently crowned King Harold was defending his territory from Norman invaders led by William. At the same time, Halley's Comet appeared in the sky overhead and frightened King Harold and his troops, leading to a successful invasion of William and the Normans, setting up the modern British monarchy. What about modern times? <laughs> the biggest time that space had an effect in our culture was, of course, when we started going there. Many people have spoken on this topic before, including one of my favorite people, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who has spoken extensively on the link between space and culture. I'll rehash some of his arguments as we go along. Do you know the first piece of hardware that had the power to exit Earth's atmosphere was? That was the V2 rocket, of course. Everybody knew, Werner von Braun all the way down, everybody knew that if we were going to have any future in space, our technology would have to borrow some, if not all of it. The 1950s descends upon us. You remember the V2 rocket? It was kind of bullet-shaped, had these huge fins. Fins. Cars had fins in the 1950s. Where do you think those fins came from? I propose the experiment. You could probably dig up the designers of those cars and they'll say, oh, I don't know, fins just kind of look cool. They're probably not even thinking about the fins on the V2 rocket, but our cars had fins. When did the fins go away? After we learned that the V2 rocket shape and those fins aren't quite the shape of rocket we need to get to the moon, our rockets start looking more like the Saturn V rather than the V2. Fins go away. What happened to the fins on the 57 Chevy Bel Air? All gone. Maybe the designers thought, oh, it's just kind of played itself out. Or maybe, deep down inside, space was operating on their creativity. By the way, that V2 rocket shape, that is the shape of rocket in every science fiction story of the 1950s. We're in any movie on Netflix from that era and their rockets have fins. Even children's drawings today use the V2 rocket shape when they draw about rockets. Now the 1960s are underway, and we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they're easy, but because they are hard. With those words, President Kennedy launched the United States into the space race. We were going to the moon in a big way and everybody knew it. We were innovating. We had an innovative culture. You knew it was an innovative culture because every week, every month, a new advance in space garners the headlines because a space frontier is being breached. And when you breach a space frontier, there's something new to talk about in that day's paper. Every next Gemini mission, more ambitious than the previous one. Transitioning out of Gemini into Apollo, let's launch the Apollo rocket, minus one of the stages. Now let's put in all the stages, but don't land yet, because we're still working that. When was that? That was 1968. Hold that here in your head, I'll get back to that. What else was going on in the 1960s? Everybody was dreaming about tomorrow. How many days could you go by before spotting an article in a magazine talking about the homes of tomorrow, the cars of tomorrow, the transportation of tomorrow? That's what the World's Fair was all about. It wasn't about yesterday, it wasn't about today, it was about tomorrow. The kind of tomorrow that can only be brought into the present by the ingenuity of scientists, engineers, and mathematicians. The 1960s is the bloodiest decade since the Civil War, since the 1860s. It makes me wonder what's going to happen in the 2060s. That decade was the death of innocence, Cuban Missile Crisis, the assassination of President Kennedy, Vietnam, heroin, Kent State, that's the 1960s. The bloodiest year in that bloodiest decade? 1968, the Tet Offensive, the My Lai Massacre, Martin Luther King assassinated, RFK assassinated. Yet, somehow we still managed to dream about tomorrow. It was still in us. Just look at what came out of that era. TV shows and movies like The Jetsons and 2001 A Space Odyssey. I knew the phrase, I'm sorry Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that, before I knew it was from 2001. That's how impacting the media from that era is. That shows that not only is space affecting these scientists, engineers, and mathematicians, it is affecting the creative dimension of that which we call culture, hardly what I call unimportant. 
What happens in December 1968? How do you cap off that year? Apollo 8, an unappreciated Apollo mission. Most people have never even heard about it. It was the first time anyone left Earth with a destination in mind. We figured it around the moon. That mission gave us one of the most iconic photos of all time, Earthrise. There was Earth, seen not as the map maker would have you see it. No, the country is not color coded with boundaries. It was seen as nature intended it to be viewed with oceans, land, clouds. We went to the moon and we discovered Earth. I claim we discovered Earth for the first time. How does that affect culture? Let's back up to 1962 briefly. Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring. The Green Movement typically credits that as the birth of environmentalism. However, others and I have a different point of view. Sure, maybe that planted some seeds until the landscape, but stuff didn't really start happening until after Earthrise was published. In 1968, the whole Earth catalog is published. Earthrise is immediately the identifying cover, showing Earth not as a place for nation's war, but Earth as a whole. Seven months later, in 1969, we land on the moon. We go to the moon until 1972, so watch this sequence of events. In 1970, the Comprehensive Clean Air Act is passed. Earth Day is birthed in March 1970. The Environmental Protection Agency is founded in 1970. The organization Doctors Without Borders is founded in 1971. Where did you even get that phrase from? No one thought of that phrase because every globe and every classroom has countries painted on it. DDT gets banned not after Rachel Carson's book, but in 1972. Clean Water Act, 1971. Endangered Species Act, 1972. The catalytic converter gets put in in 1973. Unleaded gas in 1973. We're still at war in Vietnam. There's still campus unrest. Yet we found the time to start thinking about Earth as a whole. That is space operating our culture, and you cannot even put a price on it. That is a nation, a world reacting to a new perspective on what it means to be on this place that we all share. That created, as Don McLean said in American Pie, a generation lost in space. We see that everywhere in society. That's because the space frontier was being breached. In the mid-1970s, it all ends with no time left to start again. We stopped breaching a space frontier. We started to breach an engineering frontier once we started building the International Space Station, but that's not a space frontier. We've already been there. Let me give you, let me give you some perspective. Imagine Earth as a typical schoolroom globe. Where is Mars? How many people think it's a couple of feet away? 50 feet. Anyone willing to venture further? On this scale, Mars is one mile away in the public shopping center down the street. The moon is 30 feet away, somewhere in the back of this room. The atmosphere, the atmosphere, this air that we all breathe, is as thick as the lacquer on the surface of the globe. The International Space Station is just 3 eighths of an inch above the surface. That's not advancing a space frontier. During this era in which space grabbed everyone's attention, the first plans of a space telescope came to mind. In 1946, at the end of World War II and on the eve of a whole new one, Lyman Spitzer argued for the creation and use of a space telescope. Earth-based telescopes are great, but the atmosphere gets in the way. About two decades later, Spitzer got what he wanted. NASA approved a plan, and more importantly, Congress approved a budget of $200 million. Thankfully, the European Space Agency was paying the other half. The building process began. They eventually decided to name it the Hubble Space Telescope, after Edwin Hubble, the astronomer who proved that the universe is expanding. However, its history is littered with tragedy. The pieces were slow in coming together, and a launch date in October 1986 was set. Sadly, on a cold January morning, an O-ring failed to keep hot, pressurized gas from interacting with the rocket fuel, and the Space Shuttle Challenger detonated 73 seconds after launch. As a result, all Space Shuttle missions were put on an indefinite stop. When they eventually resumed, Hubble was launched aboard Discovery in April 1990. The tragedies were not over yet. After just a few weeks of operation, scientists noted that the optical images coming back from Hubble were blurred due to an aberration in Hubble's main mirror. The Hubble Space Telescope was painted as a failure and a national embarrassment. NASA didn't lose hope, though. They sent up a repair mission, resulting in some of the longest spacewalks in human history. Now Hubble was fixed and you could see again. To help rehabilitate Hubble's reputation, NASA launched the Hubble Heritage Project in 1998 and released some of Hubble's most spectacular images of the cosmos. They inspired us. I was just two years old at the time, but I believe that the images Hubble sent back after its first servicing mission were what inspired me to study space, some of which you'll see on the next few slides. Anyway, in 2003, another tragedy occurred in the form of the Columbia explosion. The fifth and final servicing mission to Hubble was canceled, and as a result, Hubble and all the scientific research reliant on the instrument faced a bleak future. 
This time, it was the public that came to the rescue of Hubble. The self-proclaimed Hubble huggers started online petitions citing that the abandonment of Hubble would not only damage America's future as a scientific powerhouse, it would also tarnish Americans' pride and interest in astronomy. As the fate for the People's Telescope reached an all-time high, uh, uh, the American Astronomical Society and a bipartisan effort in the Senate revived the Fifth Service mission, and Hubble is expected to survive well beyond 2020. Indeed, Hubble has survived and continues to survive. In 2015, Hubble reached the old age of 25. To help commemorate this event, the public was treated to spectacular events. Not only were images displayed on the TVs in Times Square, an IMAX movie was made, and a 3D Hubble model was released for you to print out on your very own 3D printer. They even pointed the telescope back to the site of one of its most iconic photos, the Pillars of Creation. Aside from the public's love of the People's Telescope, you can still see the influence space has on culture today. People are amazed by space. Just look at who and what inspires us. People like Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Cox, and of course, my generation's favorite, Bill Nye the Science Guy. <laughs> We're honestly enthralled by what Curiosity is doing on Mars' surface, and a little saddened to learn that NASA made it sing happy birthday to itself all alone on Mars. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we just discovered gravitational waves. You have no idea what they are, but you know that they're important. One thing I'll never understand is that my generation has a love affair with Pluto, and we were delighted when New Horizons flew by and showed us that Pluto loves us too. <laughs> space and uh, space exploration will no doubt continue to influence our culture as NASA unveils their plans for manned missions to Mars. They actually use the attention that the Martian generated to announce their plans. Doubtless the first humans to walk on Mars will be as remembered as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin are. Space and space exploration give us something to look forward to tomorrow. It makes us strive towards being better people. It makes us realize how petty our conflicts are. In 1994, Carl Sagan reflected on this image. That pale blue dot is here, a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. I'll end with some of his words. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you. <laughs>